Welcome to the Heartbeat for Hire podcast. I'm your host, Lindsay Dowd. My goal is to help train leaders and sales organizations how to manage and deliver results with empathy, compassion, and kindness. Let's get started. Greetings and welcome to this episode of Heartbeat for Hire. I am so excited to bring you today's guest. Sarah Davenport is an award-winning TV anchor who spent decades on air with different NBC stations across the U.S. While a Houston-based journalist loved being a TV anchor, she missed being at home to see her children grow up. Sarah knew in her heart it was time to pivot something we talk about here, and design a life that she loved. She's an entrepreneur. She freelances with various true crime shows. She's a LinkedIn marketing expert and on-camera coach for Fortune 500 companies and business entrepreneurs. And guys, there was like 10 more things I couldn't fit in the bio. Sarah, welcome. I'm so happy to have you. Thank you so much. I'm so excited. I've been listening to your show. I love your guests. And I'm just so honored that you asked me to be here. Oh, it's my pleasure. Um, do us the honor. Give a little bit about your background. I mean, they heard a tiny bit, but maybe mm-hmm. embellish and share a little more. Sure. Um, I'm actually the daughter of one of the first female TV anchors um, in the US. So my mom started in television in the very early 70s, like 70 or 71. There were no oh women God. in no. TV news. So my mom and Oprah started together. They went yeah. and had their hair cut professionally together for the first time. She's got crazy stories about that. So I grew up in the industry, always knew I wanted to do TV news. That's all I ever wanted to do. Um, and I followed in her footsteps and I worked in small markets up to really big markets in Houston, Texas. And my dreams came true and I hated it. <laughs> like I hated it. I, I mean, like it's one of those things. Like I went, this isn't what I thought it was supposed what to be. What did I do? Like, right. Right. Yeah. Like, and now what? So here I am at the age that time, 29, working in the third largest city in the US, yeah. making amazing money, golden handcuffs galore, like you can't walk yeah. away. Um, baby number one was here, baby number two was on the way. And I'm like, there's got to be something else. So I think I went through the whole pivot and reinventing myself um and realizing that. This isn't the era of my grandparents. I mean, think about it. Years ago, you worked for 40 years for the same company, 40 hours a week, and got the $40 watch when you retired, right? Now you're working 50 to 60 years of your life. Let that sink in for a minute. 50 to 60 hours a week of your life. Mm -hmm. And you're not even getting a watch at the end. So like, like, where is today? Where are we headed? And we're not working for that same company. And so, so many people are pivoting. I think I just did the pivot early and got into being an entrepreneur. I realized like I wanted to fire my boss before she fired me. You know, I wanted to live a life that I got to design where it was more of a a life and not just making a living. So many people are making a living and they're not making a life. Well, and I realized that and I made that switch. And so I do a lot of on-camera coaching. I'm in the social marketing sphere as well. I work with these Fortune 500 companies as a LinkedIn expert, helping them. Cause people are realizing like there are benefits to social media. I, I think yes. everyone's over Facebook and Instagram and Reels and TikTok and blah, blah, blah. People haven't really um, taken the deep dive into LinkedIn and more mm-hmm. and more people are realizing that's kind of the place to oh, be. We're gonna talk about that. We're yeah. gonna talk about that. But I, I think you're to your point of, designing a life that you love and having you are like a multifaceted entrepreneur and talk about some of the things you do because you you have a lot of different interests <laughs> my husband jokes he's like can it just all fit under one umbrella like yeah. what is that umbrella and for a while I was like well it's media marketing and mascara I guess kind of I mean <laughs> I do everything in as far as media I do a lot of on-camera coaching people who want to get into speaking people who want to be in front of the camera whether they're trying to break into TV news or they want to be better when it comes to their Zoom presentations or mm-hmm. when they're doing media on LinkedIn, that's a whole other thing. Uh, then of course the LinkedIn space where I work with people on that, working with burned out broadcasters. Oh. So many people in TV are just tired of the toxic energy, right? Like you're big on culture. Oh, the I want to talk about that. In TV news is, oh, it's oppressive. It is heavy. Mm-hmm. It is, um, it's burning people out left and right. And so I work with a lot of burned out broadcasters. And then in the social marketing space, um, for years, I had friends that were doing kind of the network marketing thing. And I was like, that's so cute of you. That's great. But, you know, I'm an award-winning journalist. I don't do that. Until it got um, 
until it sort of changed into the online e-commerce game versus like yes. sitting in someone's living room. Right. And then of course, affiliate marketing got big. So I got in kind of as a combination of those two and found some health and wellness businesses that I love um, and was able to partner with them. So yeah, multi-passionate entrepreneur, like a lot of different things going on. And and let's just dig in a little more on that because I mean, I, I, my sister-in-law is like the, the queen of having six sources of income at all times. And she does some crazy stuff and she does some really sensical, really things that make sense. And then she's, you know, she, she leans on her expertise, but even just this week, I talked to a CMO who was telling me, she's like, there is no such thing as job security. You have to have multiple sources of income, which is such a, a change from what the corporate landscape has been. It, you used to sign a contract that said this is your only job. And now it's like, if you don't only have, if you only have one source of income, you're crazy. So, I mean, you figured that out early. I did. And so I'm a avid reader. You can see some of the books behind me. I mean, I have bookshelves and bookshelves um, and it's mainly, you know, personal growth and development, which for years I was like, that is so hoo ha, woo woo, who cares? Oh my gosh. Like I'm a big fan of personal growth and development. And what I've learned from reading from a lot of the experts is most millionaires have seven streams of income, seven. So I looked at it and went, okay, well, I work in TV news. My husband's in sales. We have investments. Uh, that's three. Most Americans only have two yeah. or one. Yeah. And so what else could I add in? You know, so we were able to buy property down the road. We were able to, um, not down the road, but like property down, yeah. down the line. Eventually we were able to buy some property. I wanted to get into the rental space and then different incomes, you know, through, uh, especially online, you know, everything I'm reading about this year and the years to come online income is the place to be. And it gives yeah. us our life back. We can, we're, we're in our offices right now. When we're done, we're going to walk out and go do life. I'm not in somebody's cubicle looking at the clowns to the left of me and jokers to my right, right? I choose what clowns and jokers I want to work with, right. you know? And most of the time they're my kids, right? So well, my, four, <laughs> my four clowns yeah. and jokers. True that. Um, yeah, I mean, to me, that's that's living with intention and that's mm -hmm. being really purposeful with the choices you make and the people you surround yourself with. And I love that. So let's go back a little bit and talk about culture and what mm -hmm. specifically about the news environment was mm -hmm. so toxic. Was it leadership? Was it being a woman? You know, describe some of that. Uh, yes, yes. And yes, some more to all of that. <laughs> So interestingly, my mother begged me not to get into TV. So my mm -hmm. mother made it. She was in Chicago and Philadelphia, um, you know, all the billboards, all the buses, you know, have her face on it. Everyone knew me. They didn't know me necessarily as Sarah Allen. They knew me as, oh, you're Diane Allen's daughter. So uh, by the way, sidebar, when someone says that to you, they want to be your friend because of who your mom was, right? So I started figuring out some of the pitfalls of quote fame, um, yeah. But I, it didn't deter me. For her, she actually was the first woman to ever file a suit against a network. And it was for age and sex discrimination. This was in the late 80s, early 90s, maybe. And the things that they had done to her um, and the station, the affiliate, uh, it was an O&O, &O, so owned and operated by a, a big, one of the big three. Mm -hmm. And I knew I could never then work for that station ever again when I applied. No. She said, Sarah, how they treat women, men age gracefully, you know, white men with their wrinkles, but women, you start to sag and bag, you are out the door, you yes. know? And my mom used to always joke. She said, Sarah, when your age exceeds your bra size, you're out of the business. I'm like, oh gosh, I don't have very long. <laughs> That's right? like, horrible, oh, awesome. <laughs> right? And so I was, but, you know, she really knew though it was in my heart. I am a storyteller. I am yeah. a connector. I'm a people person. This industry was meant for me. And interestingly, when I first got in upstate New York, tiny little town of Utica, New York market size market 172. And I loved it. And I, I love my experience. I mean, who's watching you? They have what, like three viewers. I mean, there's nobody up there. Um, and they, maybe you'll have five when there's a big snowstorm. But that's Utica. <laughs> right. So like, there's just not a ton of people that were watching me at that time. And, you know, and again, this was quite a long time ago and markets grow. But at that time, I was like, this is the place where I can go and make mistakes. I loved it. I had the absolute best time there, the best people um, and the best experiences. And then as I made my way up is where the culture went down. Mm. So small town, small market was fantastic. The bigger the market, the bigger the problems. Mm. Uh, and I moved my way through Tennessee and into Houston. The culture issue really shows up um, 
when it, it starts from the top, right? Mm -hmm. And here's a great example of when I knew I needed to get out. We had scooped all the other stations. I was working for NBC in Houston. We have choppers. We have live shots and satellite trucks everywhere. I mean, we are, you know, this big We're, time, 4 million yeah. people in Houston. And we, we scoop all the other stations on this huge story. So I'm anchoring the morning news. Uh, we go on at 5 a.m. 5.07 is our first commercial break. Between my anchor and I is a phone on the desk. And the phone rings during commercial break. So it's either our producer who could talk to us in our ear. So it's not our producer or like our news director or even worse, the general manager. Like oh then you're in trouble. Right. I answer it and it's the general manager. Oh boy. But I'm thinking he's going to be like, you just scooped. Like this was amazing. Yeah, Great well job. Done. He said, yeah. your earrings dangle. Take them off. What? Like that? We just we just busted our butts and got an amazing like seriously. And I mean that's why I mean these would have gotten me in trouble. Those are too big because they say oh it you know this distracts from your um, presentation yeah, like really. smaller the better. So I thought that's what they care about. They care about appearance. What happened to good journalism? So that was a real eye opener for me. And the other one being really what set me over the edge is I was pregnant with my second child. They were going to induce me on Monday, November twenty eighth. And my news director called me on Friday and said, you know, I know you were leaving for maternity leave. We need you to anchor this weekend. I'm like, but I'm having a baby at 6 a.m. on Monday morning. I know, but your viewers are going to forget you. So the more you can stay in front of them, the better. So we're going to need you to anchor the 10 p.m. on Saturday and on Sunday. And then we know you're gone for a while. And do you What'd know what you I say? I did it because oh, it felt like they just make you as a, they would never have asked a guy to do that. Right. Well, but as a woman, give birth either. <laughs> right, right, bingo. <laughs> but as a woman and they, they, they got to me and they're basically telling me, look at all of these other people. We're getting resumes. We're getting demo tapes all the time. Demo reels. So um, manipulative. Job, you better anchor the news. And I anchored the 10 PM news. I got home at 1130 and at 5 AM I got up and went to the hospital and had a baby. That's when my husband said to me, something's got to change. Enough. Oh my God. Wow. Those are terrible. Um, but really interesting perspective. And, you know, talk about the leadership style between the small market and the big market. And what was the difference? What was the thing that resonated for you that worked? Mm -hmm. So the small market, they cared about you. There was... I, it's crazy. It sounds like, you know, we would get the frozen turkey at Thanksgiving, right? Yeah. We would get uh, the, the parties that, you know, everyone still cuts out of their budget these days. They still would do that because they knew it showed we value you. I mean, it it's never perfect in small markets and medium sized markets, but mm -hmm. there was less of a threat of someone else is coming to get your job. Mm -hmm. Big market, they're driven by ratings and we would get our ratings every morning. Uh, and, you know, so I'm off the air at seven on the air from five to 7 a.m. I would do cut ins during the Today Show and then anchor the the noon show um, in between cut ins. We'd have to sit down with our news director, pull up the ratings from the night the day before. And they'd say, well, five twelve to five fourteen, your ratings plummeted. What happened? I'm like, they went to the bathroom. They got in the shower. I don't I don't know what they did. And so they review our video. Like, what did we do? Was it a bad? It was so cutthroat. So you don't have the cutthroatness in a smaller market. Uh, the bigger markets you do, the bigger markets, they let you know you can be replaced in a heartbeat. Um, 16,000 people graduate a year wanting to be on TV. And then you add all the Miss Americas. So 16,001 every year, whatever. Um, <laughs> Want to be on TV. So then you have your you know number of jobs that are open each year in the summer, like after graduations, you're looking probably 80 to 100 Mm -hmm. For 16,000 people, right? Um, but then all those people who are already in TV, everyone's trying to make their way up on that same ladder, right? And right. it's so competitive. Mm. Some of my closest friends have stayed in smaller markets in Utica and they mm. love it. Mm. They've had an amazing experience. So we think more money, more fame, more prestige, more, more, more. But that doesn't add to more happiness. More I, money does not equal more happiness. I think that um, is the same thing that I observe in corporate America. You know, you you are told, especially in sales, if you are going to progress, you need to be a manager, you need to be a leader. But do they ask the question? Most often they don't. Do they ask the question, why do you want to be a manager? Do you like people? Do you like seeing them be successful? Because if you do, then you're doing the right thing. If you only care about yourself, which a lot of the best sellers do, no fault. It's just right. they do. 
they shouldn't go into management. Mm -hmm. And it's, there's a lot of parallels to me of, you know, the, the bigger the environment, the more cutthroat it can be, but that's not always the case. It's more of just, does your leader see you and do they value you as a human? And if they do, you're going to have a better experience. Now, question for you, the leadership style that you had when someone's being cutthroat and saying, do this, do this, or you're, you're dead versus, oh my God, I care about you. And I love how you did that. And here's your Turkey. What, who did you work harder for? You know, that's a great question. I, I think I, I am personally, I'm the kind of person who works hard for everybody. So I worked hard for all of it, but I, I had a better quality of life Mm -hmm. in that smaller environment, in the bigger environment. I was working just as hard, but there were nights, Sunday nights where I would go to bed in tears saying, Mm. Lord, why am I in Houston? Like, why did you bring me? Like, I'm, I'm, I'm confused. (laughs) I thought this is what I was supposed to do. I thought this is what I was supposed to want. And I'm here. And, and when you're dreading Mondays, when you get a pit in your stomach on a Sunday, been there. Time to reevaluate and to stop thinking about reevaluating, stop talking about reevaluating because nothing's going to get done. At some point, you have to take the jump. And that's where I work with these broadcasters going, here's when you know it's time to leave. And then here are the different steps. Because a lot of people don't realize you have so many transferable skills that can really apply to different arenas. But you think, I'm just in PR. I need to stay in PR. I'm just in TV. I need to stay here. I'm just in sales. I need... There's so many other things that you can do. You're not a one trick pony. Open your mind up to it. I love that. And I think that's so true for anybody in a job. If you've done anything for any amount of time, you've developed a skill set and likely a few of them. So a lot of those skill sets will transfer. And I, I so often when I'm coaching people, they don't realize how unhappy they are. And it takes a mirror to say, do you understand that you're compromising your values? Do you understand that you're not enjoying yourself? And they feel trapped. This is what I have to do. I made it this far. I'm a vice president. I'm a this, you know, whatever it is. It's it's so, so heartbreaking. Uh, yeah. And in that, um, with that thought, as a parent, I think we need to reevaluate and realize you have 18 summers with your children. Right. Like let that sink in 18 summers. So, and really more like 16, because when they when they're when they get their driver's license, they're gone anyway. So 16 summers. If you're working uh, and killing yourself in something, you're miserable and you're living for those two or three weeks of vacation. But let's be honest, you're spreading it out over Christmas, you're spreading spreading it out over Easter, you go see family, you're not really making the memories, you're going through the hamster wheel of life. And now at the start of a new year, maybe it's time to look and go, what do What does my family want? What is the legacy I want to leave, right? And so if you can say those things and really think it through, I talk with my kids. In fact, on the drive to school this morning, you're going to laugh. This is ridiculous. I drive my kids 30 to 40 minutes each day to school one way and then back. And I've got four kids. So I'm in the car a lot. We either listen to podcasts or we just talk and have conversations. Um, And it's the best time. Gosh, that windshield time with your kids. I love that time. So I've got kids from ages 10 through 21. I spread them out because of guess what? TV contracts can't be hired when you're pregnant, can't be hired. And, you know, thinking about getting pregnant right away. I mean, it's ridiculous that my children are planned around TV contracts anyway. um, But I love having these and planting these seeds of entrepreneurship with my kids, because when they get into the workforce, they're going to need other streams of income. Right planting seeds of what to look for in a company. Right before we hopped on, I'm working with my college student on his LinkedIn, on his internships for the summer. But he already said, well, my goal is once I want to work for a year and then be able to invest in a property to start with. I mean, he's already thinking about multiple streams of income. We need to teach our kids this because it's not being taught in school. Right. Well, I think it's it's becoming the norm for for younger people. I mean, certainly if you look at TikTok or you look at Insta, the amount of entrepreneurial opportunities there are are they're everywhere. And it's yes. more the the lesson that I think I need to teach is how do you know when it's whack and how do you know when it's a really <laughs> good opportunity? Because that it's new to us, but this is like what they're growing up in. It's it's really different. Yeah. And so having those conversations with your kids and then looking at your own life and say, am I modeling that for them? Mm -hmm. If I'm stressed out, if I'm spending the best part of my days with coworkers and not my family, Mm -hmm. if I feel like I know my coworkers better than my kids know me, 
things need to change. So that's one of the reasons we bought property on a river. So we could spend weekends intentionally away from social media, off your phones. Let's get out in the kayak. Let's get out and wakeboard. Let's get out and do things as a family that bring us joy. Oh. And so I really encourage people to reevaluate what brings you joy. Mm. Where It may just be playing tennis. It might be, you know, board game nights with the kids. Schedule it in over the next year. Schedule joy into your life. And if it's still have that knot in your stomach on Sunday night, then you really need to reevaluate. Is it time for the oh, pivot? Such good advice. Okay. I have so many other questions planned, but let me ask you this. Um, so you've observed so many leaders because you do your on-camera coaching for leaders. What are some of the characteristics of the really good leaders? Oh gosh, that's a great, that's a great one. Um, someone that's coachable. Mm. Yeah, that's kind of crazy because they're a leader. True. But they, you can be at the top of your game, but if you're still not learning, I mean, school's never out for the pro. You should no. always be learning, right? So coachable. Um, I feel like leaders are other focused. It's not just about me, me, me. How can you help me so we can be better? It's what can I do? Because if I show you that I care about you and I value you and I pour into you, you're only going to do more mm. for my company or for what, you know, whatever it may be. I say so that all the time other focused, being coachable, um, being humble, mm. right? Ego. Gosh, man, if we could just throw ego out the door. I mean, that mm. is so, and it's still, it's something that's not talked that much about, but it is holding so many people back and personally, and then holding others back. Right. So mm -hmm. coachable, being humble, you know, letting the ego go. Um, and I'd also say, you know, find that excitement, that drive, you know, something that gets you out of bed. It's crazy, but I literally, when my feet hit the floor every morning, I am excited for life. I have so many amazing things going on Love. in my life and in business and things like it just oozes out of me. That's great. That excitement. If you are not getting up out of bed, excited, if your your feet hit the floor or you're hitting snooze a hundred times, like we need to talk. Something's got to change. But anyway. Okay. So speaking of one of your interests is the true crime space. How did you find yourself there? And what are you doing? Because it's, I mean, that's a hot space. It's a hot space. And it's so funny. So I worked in Knoxville, Tennessee. And in Knoxville, they have something called the body farm there. And uh, Patricia Cornwell is the first one to coin the phrase body farm. She is a great um, murder mystery yeah. author. And so the show I did in Knoxville was a lifestyle show. So I got mm -hmm. to, Patricia was on my show. I got to interview her and she was going to the body farm to do research for her next book. It was called Blowfly. That's how long ago we did this interview. And so I got to tag along, my cameraman and I did. And so we went to the body farm and the body farm is where bodies are decomposing in different situations so that they can study it. That you've got the Canadian Mounties, the Texas Rangers come in, people come to study because of the climate in Tennessee is, um, it has every base, every climate possible, right? You get yeah. very, very cold freezes, very, very hot days. And time of death is really important when it comes to um, figuring out um, when they're investigating murders. I mean, I could go all into it. I'm very intrigued by all of it. So I spent a day on the body farm. My friends are like, that's just crazy. Like what oh, you gross. do. <laughs> yeah. But I found it so interesting. Um, and that's how I started my my love of true crime, because it's not about the murder or the crime. It's about how do they figure out who did it? Mm -hmm. And it's coming back to these basic things. Um, so I, you know, was very interested in that, obviously covered in Houston, a ton of crime. I mean, yeah, it's ridiculous. And also when I knew to get out of TV, when I walked in one morning and I said, how many stabbings and shootings? They go, God, slow night, only five. What? Like, what? why? Why is that? how we think and feel now, like something's got to change. So, no. mm. right. Anyway, that's, but there's, I covered so many crimes, so many murder trials, and I was approached by different production companies because some of my coverage and some of the interviews I've been able to do. And some of the interviews I've done, uh, like death row interviews and interviews behind bars and staring at a convicted murderer in the eyes is crazy. And when you interview mm. them, I mean, it is a different look than what you've seen. Um, Anyway, so I had been doing a lot of that. I was approached about it. And now I do different shows, a lot of snapped killer couples, uh, Vengeance, which is on HLN, um, Oxygen, you know, different shows. So it's always intriguing to me. I love being able to be a true crime reporter. Um, all the Murdoch murders are going on right now. The whole Murdoch murder oh, trial. Yeah. 
I um, have been involved in that somewhat doing some interviews and some things. So it's, uh, it, it's just, it's a lot of fun. And it's a way for me to keep my foot in the door of being a journalist and being on camera. Sure. And so that- People need to remember, you may walk away from a career, but it doesn't mean you can't do something that incorporates that career. The part of the career that you loved, you Mm -hmm. can still do in some way. It might take a little bit of digging, but you can do it. I think even Barbara Walters, bless her heart, you know, she talked about how the special saved her and it wasn't the anchor. It was her doing these special shows and she loved it. And she took that and she started the view. I mean, it's the same kind of thing, taking the best pieces and, and reinventing yourself to repurpose what you love. So I love that. Um, Okay. So you are also a LinkedIn marketing guru. Um, Can you give a couple of your best tips for folks on LinkedIn? Absolutely. I think a lot of people see LinkedIn as just as a place to find a job. I know. I used to. I talk about this all the time. But oh, I oh, it drives me crazy. So I'm actually going to be working with college students on LinkedIn on how to Great. don't like don't start with that attitude. Let's immediately get into um, the wealth of connections, of knowledge, of what you can learn on LinkedIn. Uh, I've had to work with some college students who are posting like, "Oh my gosh, my class ring!" Like that's not which you post on LinkedIn people, but you can truly curate a network of people that you want in your life. You can't do that. Like you've got your friends and your aunt yeah. Mabel on Facebook and then yeah. Instagram, all these randoms or, you know, whatever, but creating a network that you care about and then creating content that speaks to that network. Mm. So less than 4% of LinkedIn users post content regularly. So think about that statistic and what happens, right? If you post consistently, people are going to see you. They're going to start to know you, like you, trust you from your content. So that when, if you are applying for a job, they're going to go to your profile. They're going to see your activity and see all this great, like, wow, that separates you from someone who just has up their work experience. And it's like a resume online. Mm -hmm. They're missing the great things of LinkedIn. Um, A lot of people don't really know how to use the messaging on LinkedIn and how people on LinkedIn really do, for the most part, they're willing to support you. So my son in college, who's looking for an internship in medical device sales, is reaching out to other people in that community saying, tell me your best tips. Like, what did you do? Like, what what should I be expecting? What should I look for? And people are responding to him wholeheartedly Mm -hmm. through the messaging. So it's not the weird messaging like, hey, let's connect on LinkedIn. Let's see how we can help, both help each other. Like, that's not authentic. So being authentic uh, on LinkedIn is not something that people really understand how to do. So I really coach people on that and then also coach them on their profiles. Your profile is your business card. And if it's just like, I'm a marketing manager, wow. yes, right? Mine says, I'm a burned out TV anchor who wanted more. I mentor others to get out of the ratings race. So people in TV click on that and they're like, oh, she got out. She, she admitted she was, I got to talk to her. Yeah. Right. And I'm vulnerable. I'm honest. And I tell the truth about my experiences and what I believe I'm, it's not a political place. Do not get political on LinkedIn. Right. No. Uh, don't, don't share the cereal you had for breakfast. That's for Facebook, but you can use LinkedIn and build an amazing network of people, people who become right. friends and Everything I'm telling you, everything in life comes down to your network. Your network equals your net worth. Mm. Building it up. So true. So true. Those are gold. And I agree with everything you said. And I have something for your son when we're done. Okay. Um, but um, okay. So how about some on-camera tips? Because there's a lot of people that are dipping their toe in video. I have um, a couple people that I know just indulge themselves with four or five minute videos talking about laundry and whatever else is on their mind. I mean, what are some good rules of thumb for creating video on um, LinkedIn? Okay. So for on LinkedIn, it needs to be giving a tip, some advice, some um, inspiration, not your laundry, not your cereal. Don't go up there just to, just to be on video. Mm-hmm. Since the age of, you know, the selfie and the blah, 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 you know, all the videos, everyone suddenly is on camera, Yes, but it's not professional. So if you think, oh, I've done videos, I've done so many reels, I can just put that right onto uh, LinkedIn. No, LinkedIn actually doesn't like that. The algorithm is not going to see that uh, in a positive way. Now, when someone's doing a video, what I coach them on, little things. So I'm going to move my um, 
my computer for a second. So my computer's up a little bit. A lot of times it's down like this and I'm looking mm-hmm. up someone's nose, right? Mm-hmm. They don't know that your computer should be up above. So actually the camera on my computer is actually way up here. It's mm-hmm. much higher. And therefore it looks like I'm actually looking at you, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you don't want to be, you know, on camera, you don't want a lot of distracting colors. Oh my gosh. I was working with a lady who was shooting her videos in her living room with a thousand longer burger baskets in the background. I'm like, oh, wow. That's so I'm now staring at the baskets and what all's going on there and not listening to her. So when you record a video, you want it to be like, and your background's just fantastic. It's just beautiful and simple (laughs) and elegant, right? My office actually has three different backgrounds. Um, I almost have it as a mobile studio. My computer's Mm. on a rolling little um, mini desk that tilts up. So I have a tilt to my computer, you know, the lighting, depending on day or night. Um, Obviously the newer, the computer, actually the higher def, the higher, you know, it's HD, higher resolution. So you are going to actually have to wear a little bit of makeup on camera when I work with people and I'm like, Oh geez. Okay. Where are we going to start? Let's start on makeup and let's start, you know, there's, there's a lot just on the look. And then we work on um, how you come across. Because some people, they have a script like, and so did, good evening. My name is your name oh. here. Da, 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 you know, like, oh my gosh. Yeah. So I work a lot on how you come across. Your eyes are really important. You tell a story yeah. with your eyes, with That's your right. voice, with your inflection. So we work with all of that too. Oh, love those tips. Those are great. Um, okay. So I know you were a division one tennis player and you love sports and outdoor um, everything. So um, how do you, I mean, those are things obviously that inspire you. What else inspires you? Um, travel. I believe in collecting memories and not things. Mm, and so I, I you know, I want to fill my kids' passports with stamps and not their rooms with collectible crap. Um, that is my goal. And so this past year, I took a week long trip with my 10 year old and we went to Mexico for a week. And I said, what do you want to do each morning? You want to go swim with the dolphins? You want to go dig up seashell? Like, what do you want to do? And in October, I did it with my 14 year old. We went to Jamaica and to create these memories. Now, of course, in television, I had the money to do this. I had no time. And then when I left TV before, it went, you know, when I was starting up my online businesses, I had all the time, wasn't there. Yeah. but I had no money. Right. So my goal with my life and the legacy I want to leave is I want to show my kids that they are, they are my legacy. They are the most important things in the world to me. It is not the money. It's not the big house. It's not the cars or the boats, or the blah, blah, blah. It's, they are the most important thing to me uh. and valuing true, um, the family time and really my husband travels a lot, you know, and I do travel some for work, but when we are home, we are home. Mm. The little things like putting our, our phones down at the, like there are no phones at the dinner table. I mean, and we're having family dinners, the Love old that. school way. Right. So um, travel and family are probably the two biggest passions that I have. Uh, my goal is to take 10 to 12 weeks of vacation a year oh, and I love it. because I only got three weeks of vacation in TV. And so if yeah. I'm going to be a multi-passionate entrepreneur, I want to enjoy the things I didn't get in television. And oh, that's well, you already kind of took my next question, which was, what do you want your legacy to be? And you touched yeah. on it early and then you talked about it with your kids, <laughs> anything you left out. You know, I really also want to be an inspiration to others who feel stuck because I think, you know, again, my mother in the seventies and eighties, is one of the few women that were working a lot of stay at home moms back then. Right. Yeah. And so dual family incomes really started to take form in the eighties, nineties and, and beyond. And I think as women, we often feel like, okay, we work our crazy hours, we come home and now we have to do the laundry, make the food. Yeah and try to be happy. And like, we're frustrated. We're thinking about work. And then in the morning, the alarm goes off and we do it again and again on a hamster wheel of life. My goal is I want to help people get off that hamster wheel, Mm. figure out what it is that they want out of life, and then help them to know the steps to start making that happen. Whether it's through, okay, here's how we're going to use your LinkedIn to find that dream job. And we're going to first figure out what it is that you want. Like, what are you made for? Why are you here? And then the next step is figuring out, well, what would that look like? And just expanding your, your ideas and your thoughts and your goals, you know, and and working on goal setting. My gosh, so many, so few people know that if you don't write your goal down, like physically write it, you have less than a 20% chance of it actually happening. So my legacy would be helping other women 
figure out that there's more to life than the nine to five and the hamster wheel. Ah, those are great. All right, Sarah, how do people find you? Uh, They can go to sarahdavenport.net. Think of N for news, not com, sarahdavenport.net. And in fact, a few of them, a few more programs are being uploaded on there that I'm going to be doing, but yes, I would love to connect with anybody who's interested. Oh, thank you. You have been such a pleasure. You have so much to share. I'm so grateful you were a guest today. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. I loved it. Awesome. Hope you enjoyed this episode, everyone. See you soon. Thanks for listening to Heartbeat for Hire. If you like what you hear, I'd love it if you'd subscribe and leave a five-star review. To keep the conversation going, you can find me on Insta or at LinkedIn at Lindsay Dowd, H4H, or you can reach me at my website, heartbeatforhire.com. Thanks so much. Have a great day.